So, hello, how are you? Good, I hope. Uh, I'm feeling okay, too. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit today about COVID-19. I promise y'all I'd do something on that. Uh, and what I'm going to do is a fairly recent updated report on uh, COVID-19 that was put together by uh, Dr. Joy Alizan, uh, Alonzo, who uh, is a uh, Joy Alonzo, who is an epidemiologist with uh, uh, Texas A&M University, and they're working on a on a uh, vaccine for COVID-19 right now. But uh, this is a, a PowerPoint that she did, and she gave me permission to use it. Uh, and she did this back in September of uh, this year, just a couple of weeks before our class started. And already some of the information that's on uh, the presentation slides are, is outdated. Uh, and if you're following diseases, and uh, you will be to a certain degree in your uh, practices, you have to stay up on, uh, up on top of things because uh, uh, numbers are updated pretty much daily. Uh, new information comes down the pipe, new treatments come up, uh, uh, we find out more about the illness, how it's spread, that kind of thing. COVID-19, as you know, is a big deal, uh, and it's been a big deal for uh, the better part of 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, from the days uh, back in uh, March and April when the when we were hearing things like there were only a few people had it and it would be gone in a number of days, that kind of thing. Well, we're over 200,000 dead and counting. We'll probably have 300,000 to 400,000 dead by the first of the year. Uh, and there is no turning the corner on it as far as we can tell. I mean, there's no science to support that. I, I hear that, but there's no science to support it. So uh, just, in, uh, just in term of the butcher's bill, how many people have uh, succumbed to the illness uh, is, uh, uh, you know, is a different number every day. How many people are diagnosed with the illness is a different number every day. Uh, and when you're looking at statistics and you're trying to draw a clear picture of what's going on, uh, we can look at a number of levels. We can draw distinctions and comparisons between what's going on nationally, what's going on globally in the world, uh, what's going on regionally and locally, what's going on in Harris County, what's going on in Baytown, compared to the state, compared to the nation, compared to other cities our size. There's a whole bunch of things you can do with these demographics and these numbers. Also, uh, when you're, when you're uh, uh, looking at this, you should be looking too at uh, uh, you know, uh, latest updates. Is there a cure for COVID-19? No, there isn't. Uh, I'm glad the president's doing better. I'm glad he's been cleared to go back out and have, you know, rallies and whatnot. Uh, but uh, there is no cure for COVID-19. If he got over it quickly, well, good for him. There's some good therapeutic drugs coming down the pike, though. Uh, that'll treat the symptomologies and help people get over it. But viruses still today, we're not real good at curing them. Uh, we manage symptoms and keep people alive till their bodies fight them off, basically. We heard the same sort of uh, thing back in uh, the 80s and 90s with the uh, uh, human immunovirus, the, the virus that causes AIDS. And uh, COVID-19, by the by, is in the same family as that. It's a retrovirus. It uses reverse transcriptase to superimpose its RNA on the DNA of cells that it invades and turns your body into a breeder of new viruses. Uh, and uh, that's a bunch of biological stuff that uh, you may get into and you may not, but, but suffice it to say that once it's in you, it's hard to get rid of it. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, there's not uh, uh, a vaccine in the offing yet. Uh, and I know that I keep hearing that we're going to have one by election day, but I really doubt it. 
Uh, and even if we have something by election day, it, uh, it won't be available to people until well into the next year. So um, don't go hanging your hats on that. That said, I want to go ahead and uh, share my uh, uh, screen with you, share my PowerPoint with you, which is Dr. Joy Alonzo's PowerPoint, giving credit where credit's due and not being a dirty plagiarist or a thief. Uh, and then uh, I'll walk you through that, and then I'm going to talk to you about an assignment. Uh, generally, when I do a lecture, you can expect a quiz behind it, just to kind of make sure that you watched it. It's not a hard quiz. If you paid attention to the, to the lecture, it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, but uh, you have to watch the lecture for it to be easy, or else be a good guesser, one or the other. Okay, with that said, I'm going to run right over to the um, PowerPoint and share that with you. A key thing to note about this, and it's got Joy's credentials on there. She's a medical engineer and doctor of pharmacy, assistant clinical professor, peer recovery specialist, and uh, uh, all of that good stuff, and uh, co-chair Texas A&M's opioid task force. So the focus of Dr. Uh, Alonzo's uh, research and the focus of her presentation is uh, geared toward uh, opioid use. And the use of drugs, uh, and, and I hesitate to say recreational use, but I don't know what other term to use right now. People who are doing drugs for fun or doing drugs uh, uh, as, a, as a, a utilitarian thing to make themselves feel better. Uh, Drug use patterns have been affected by COVID-19, and so has substance use treatment efforts. Uh, many treatment centers, and this might be something for you to look up, you might want to make a note of this, how many treatment centers nationwide have closed since the uh, coronavirus pandemic began back in March, really? Uh, and there have been a lot of them have just shut down. Uh, they can't do business the way they were doing business prior to uh, the pandemic. Uh, that's a thing that's happened. Another thing that's happened is we have seen in Harris County and the state of Texas and across the board in the nation, we've seen an uptick in opioid-related overdoses uh, in that same period of time. People are ODing uh, out there on, on opioids. They're ODing on other things, too. Uh, recently, a Florida man, you can underline that, Florida man, uh, who has a history of opioid abuse, didn't have any opioids. He was out of them. Uh, and he was tweaking, and he wanted to feel better, so he ate a whole bunch of Xanax, uh, a benzodiazepine. Now, benzodiazepines will not cause you, uh, will not uh, cause uh, withdrawal syndromes from opioids to stop, but they will, you know, do things like make you pass out and stop your breathing and things like that. So the Florida man winds up in a hospital where they know he's overdosed, and so they're giving him Narcan, naltrexone, uh, to uh, bring him uh, out of that overdose because they know who he is. He has a history, and he's been a patient there before, and the police know who he is, so they have no problem administering uh, the uh, opioid antagonist either except the opioid antagonist does not make him more responsive and does not bring him out of his coma. And if you're familiar uh, with naltrexone uh, uh, rescue kits, uh, the conclusion that you draw immediately from that is this isn't an opioid overdose, and it wasn't. 
but it was an overdose by an opioid user who didn't have any opioids, who was looking to get high and find some kind of relief elsewhere. Uh, is that because of COVID-19? I don't know. Uh, you know, but uh, sources have dried up for some, and they're having to look for alternatives. Uh, we'll talk about what those, what some of those other issues are here in just a bit. Update first on COVID-19. COVID-19 uh, is uh, coronavirus, coronavirus disease 19. Uh, and that's what it is, it's a novel coronavirus. Uh, and the disease uh, was discovered in uh, 2019, so hence COVID-19. And that's how the name became the name. Uh, and since the, and I, and I kind of mark, mark the uh, pandemic as far as I'm concerned, as far as my interest in it goes on, on this end, as beginning in March of uh, 2020. Y'all remember March of 2020? That's when we went on the spring break that never ended. Uh, I'm still on it. Uh, so we're not going, uh, you know, going back to the school and conducting business as usual. Life for a lot of us has changed significantly in light of this, uh, in light of this pandemic. And uh, the, uh, it's going parallel with the opioid epidemic, which hasn't slowed down in the slightest. Uh, there has been, there have been some factors that have uh, uh, kind of changed the, uh, the way that the uh, uh, opioid ep epidemic has been manifested. And uh, the changes like uh, doctors over the last couple of years have started, uh, uh, well, have begun to curtail their uh, 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 prescription of opioids. And you, you might walk into your doctor's office and see a sign up there on the window that says, we no longer prescribe opioid pain medications or something to that effect. And this is largely from the federal government's enforcement uh, uh, efforts that have shut uh, physicians down on doing this. Uh, so uh, legal sources for people to get uh, their drugs that they're addicted to have tended to dry up. Uh, consequently, that opens the door for more illegal sources. So we're seeing people who might otherwise be using prescription pain medication switching over to doing heroin or some other uh, illegal uh, substances. And in the heroin and in some of the bootleg pills and things like that, you find a synthetic opioid that's fairly dangerous on its own, and that's fentanyl, and you've probably heard about that. Uh, IV drug use, uh, I don't really have the data on whether that's up or down or, or, or uh, whatever, but we need uh, to gather that data for evidence-based harm reduction uh, purposes. And uh, how are we going to help people not hurt themselves while they're holed up during this whole pandemic thing? Cons uh, also concurrently, an issue that runs along with the pandemic is uh, stress and depression levels. People uh, have lost their jobs. People don't see any sign of being able to get a new job. Uh, uh, a lot of things that uh, uh, one of the hardest hit industries in our area is the restaurant and bar business. People don't, are not going to bars or restaurants. Uh, and consequently, wait staff are out of work. Bartenders are out of work. All the support people for that kind of industry are out of work. Uh, uh, teachers are affected, doctors are affected, nurses are affected. Uh, everyone is affected one way or another. Uh, and so uh, for people who can't work, have no source of income coming in or relying on unemployment, whatever, uh, there's also a concurrent depression that happens uh, with that. Uh, Sometimes it's handled with medicine, sometimes with the talking cure or counseling, uh, you know. Uh, and, and there are medicine shortages too. 
the American Medical Association, which has been pretty flexible as well as the DEA and uh, uh, et cetera, uh, are encouraging governors and uh, state legislators to take uh, action and to follow the SAMHSA and DEA rules and guidances uh, in full, you know, for the duration for, how, for however long this lasts. Uh, and uh, to do what we can to keep the number of overdoses down, et cetera. Apart from drug use and overdoses, we also see an increase in suicidality and domestic violence and child abuse uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and drinking you know, as well. So it's not just opioids that uh, are, uh, are at issue. There's current information uh, available to people, and so uh, an assignment, and I'm going to post it uh, online for you so that you'll be able to go to the website and do it, but your assignment is to update at least three areas of this presentation to go get data and update what I'm telling you today, and it's updatable. I'll touch on that again before I get through with this presentation. But here's the deal. If you're going to be updating information and if you're going to do anything that you're presenting to people out there in the world, you want to get your uh, uh, information from credible sources. One of the most not credible or incredible <laughs> sources that you can possibly have is social media. Social media Anytime you log on to Facebook or anytime you go to Twitter, anytime you uh, do a TikTok, uh, you get slapped right between the eyes with all kinds of misinformation, uh, mistakes sometimes that people make in interpreting data and not presenting it correctly, and outright lies and bullshit that people just for whatever reason, post, share, whatever. Uh, uh, if QAnon jumps immediately to mind, uh, all of this, all of this crap, and that's what it is. The QAnon post has been stuff uh, that's been floating around. Uh, it, it was being uh, they, they were doing fax campaigns back in the eighties on the same kind of crap you're hearing. Uh, from QAnon today. It's just been recycled and updated into a more uh, modern social media format. Uh, so you can't uh, rely on that stuff. And uh, some of these people are pretty slick. They'll make uh, uh, websites that will have uh, uh, the, I forget what it's called, the link crap here. Uh, that will look almost exactly like a reliable uh, source, but it'll have a couple of things changed. Uh, anyway, uh, you can't rely on it. News reporting on TV is not particularly credible either. Uh, Fox says it's fair and balanced. is not. Neither is CNN. Uh, they have a political agenda uh, that they interject into their news and they have a position uh, that they uh, take on the news. Uh, back some years ago I was teaching a uh, humanities class on, and talked about mass communication and uh, I had a couple of examples. Uh, I might be able to find those and share them with you, I don't know. Uh, but it was from a, 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 it was a publication of the Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks uh, hate groups in the United States. Uh, but uh, it, uh, uh, there were two headlines in there that showed uh, a political bias into the way that they introduced their stories. One was Asian youth murdered by skinheads. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was the bold type that you saw before you saw that, uh, that you saw before you uh, uh, saw the uh, uh, rest of the article. 
and, an, and another story uh, said that uh, uh, Skin had killed an altercation. He wasn't murdered, he was killed. <laughs> you know? So uh, he said something to someone, they offed him the end over. Uh, so you, the language that you use and how you and the uh, and the numbers and how you present the numbers, statistics, etc., uh, reveal political biases in those sources. There's also confirmation bias, and confirmation bias is important too, uh, because Fox and CNN and other organizations, Breitbart, uh, Epoch Times, all of these things, they know their audience. Uh, and they present information and sometimes mispresent, misrepresent information in a way uh, that their audience uh, appreciates. The, they know what their audience wants to hear and they give it to them. Uh, a good source of information will tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. <laughs> you know, that's how you know you got a pretty good, uh, pretty good information source. Uh, and so... Focus on credible sources. Uh, where are some credible sources for COVID-19? Globally, World Health Organization, the best in the world. Wait a minute, Bushart, don't lay that on us. We know that the World Health Organization helped China cover up this COVID thing. They were attacking us with it uh, because we've seen it on the Internet. We know that's how it works. Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, they didn't cover up anything. They didn't help, uh, uh, you know, uh, China pull the wool over America's eyes. China's a closed society. It's real hard to get good data out of there about anything. They're, they're very, they keep it very close to the vest. They don't um, share a lot. Uh, China should have let us know more. Uh, the World Health Organization, had they the information that they could verify, would have let us know more. But they didn't have the information, they couldn't verify it. Uh, and so that's been kind of uh, a red herring, so to speak. Anyway, uh, the United States has pulled out of the World Health Organization and is, uh, and is no longer a member nation. We don't get to uh, participate to the extent that we used to. Uh, but you can. You can go to this link right here, and you can click on it, and you can find out all kinds of things about all kinds of diseases, the novel coronavirus, Ebola River fever, uh, you know, SARS, uh, 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 all of that. I'm trying to think of the one that we had coming from South, from Central America last year, that, but the name's escaping me, so... Uh, the Vika virus, something like that. I can't remember. Uh, nationally, the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, that's the CDC. Uh, and the CDC uh, is, you know, uh, when I hear people complain about the CDC, they say, well, you know, they never take a real stand on anything. It's kind of like it could be this, it could be that, maybe this, maybe that. That's 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 pure science, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they're not going to tell you uh, up is up unless they're for sure up is up. If there's any possibility that it's down or sideways, they're not going to commit to it. Uh, but you can get very, very good data and very, very good numbers from the CDC. Currently, going back to uh, the focus on credible sources, there's rumors going around out there that... Uh, that uh, coronavirus isn't as bad as everyone said because uh, the, the the CDC manipulated the data. They, uh, you know, and when you uh, fix the data and you take out everything that has, uh, you know, co-occurring disorders or underlying conditions, then only around six percent of the people who are diagnosed with it uh, are. are who were counted as deaths from COVID, only about 6% of the CD death, uh, C, uh, CDC death rate was uh, valid, uh, which is absolutely untrue, <laughs> you know, absolutely untrue. Uh, if you have cirrhosis of the liver, all kinds of bad things can happen to you as your cirrhosis worsens. You may be like my brother and die 
of, uh, of sepsis, which is a blood infection, a bacterial blood infection. And that is what killed my little brother. He died of uh, bacterial sepsis, uh, which he would not have had if he hadn't have had cirrhosis of the liver that uh, was secondary uh, to, uh, uh, to, to a viral infection of uh, hepatitis C. Uh, so uh, the blood infection was the method of death. The cause of death was cirrhosis and hep C. So you got to sort through that information kind of carefully before you make a, a, you know, a conclusion on that. Locally, you want to know what's going on in Harris County. You want to know what's going on in Houston or Baytown or Galveston or, you know, Brazoria or whatever. These are the places you look at. You go to the local ones. Uh, your local data compared with your state data, compared with your national data, compared with your global data will help you draw all kinds of conclusions about this and help provide good information to people who, uh, uh, who need it. I'm not trying to make uh, st statisticians out of you. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, suggest that this is where you spend all of your time. Uh, but occasionally you'll need to know this, you know, when you're putting together presentations and when you're talking to people. And just to get a clear picture of what you need to do next, where, where Dr. Alonzo was coming from here and this organization that she presented this to, the Southeast Coal Coalition, they're about prevention. And if you're going to prevent something, you need to know the magnitude of that something that you're going to, uh, that you're going to try to prevent. And you need to come up with some evidence-based strategies once you have defined what the problem is and the scope of the problem. Does that make sense? Uh, how many uh, fire trucks are you going to need to put out the fire? Depends on how big the fire is, how it spread, what is burning, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, if you're going to share facts about COVID-19 uh, and stop the spread of rumors, then you need to you need to know. And these these are facts. They're not hypothesis. They're not maybes. They're not you know any of that. These are Two and two equals four. Diseases can make anyone sick, regardless of their race, uh, of their race or ethnicity. Uh, white people get sickle cell anemia. Uh, Non-Jewish people get Bars uh, uh, syndrome. So it's not something. Even though there's a tendency, maybe for one race, one ethnicity, or something to to. Uh, uh, to, to get an illness, um, you know, it can, any human being can get an illness. Uh, it'll affect all of us. I, I, I can't help but think about HIV disease, AIDS, back in the day when I was first learning about it, when I, was first, when I saw my first patient with it and all of that good stuff. Uh, and people were saying, and... The first client I ever worked with was gay. He was a brilliant guy. He didn't live long after I met him. He was pretty sick when I met him and on his way out. Uh, but uh, a brilliant young man, and uh, he was gay. And this was a time when they were saying AIDS is gay cancer. It's gay-related immunodeficiency uh, disease. He died of gay pneumonia, uh, that kind of thing. And as long as it was a gay disease, people who weren't gay didn't worry about it. But HIV is an everyone disease. Uh, and, you know, you can get it a whole bunch of ways other than just being uh, gay and from sex practices. But so anyone can get sick. Everyone's at risk. Some are more at risk than others. Uh, for most people, the immediate risk of becoming seriously ill from COVID is pretty uh, pretty low. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people get it and are over it in a relatively short time, particularly if you're younger, particularly if you're healthy. Uh, but that's not always true. Uh, and if you have, uh, you know, complicating disorders, if uh, 
if you're a smoker, if you're a drug user, if you're older, if you have a history of asthma, emphysema, heart disease, diabetes, any of this kind of stuff, uh, it can complicate things for you. And some people get real sick real fast, and others uh, don't. If you're overweight, uh, that's a complicating uh, uh uh, condition that could make uh, make it harder for you if you got COVID-19. Fact three, if you have completed quarantine and are testing negative, had two negative swabs, you're considered uh, basically, uh, uh, you don't, uh, you, you're considered relatively risk-free in terms of uh, uh, spreading uh, the disease. So if you've completed your period of isolation, you've tested negative, you're free to go. Uh, I'm assuming that's kind of what happened with President Trump, but we don't know for sure because they have not and will not release any data about whether he has uh, tested negative or not. Uh, but his doctor, or a, one of his doctors, did say he was... Um, you know, symptom-free and should be able to, you know, have a rally or whatever the hell he's going to do. Uh, so, uh, fact four, there are simple things you can do to keep yourself and other people healthy. And this is, uh, this is really, uh, really simple stuff. Wash your hands often with soap and water. This will help you not get things like the cold and the flu and COVID-19 and a whole bunch of other things that you might get uh, if you uh, fail to do this. This is also called good hygiene. You should wash your hands when you go to the bathroom. That, I, I know, right? You should wash your hands after you go to the bathroom uh, and before you eat anything or prepare anything for someone else to eat. It's good manners, it's good hygiene, and it'll keep you from uh, uh, getting sick and from passing uh, that illness on to other people, usually. Uh, my mother used to tell me, you know, if you go out of the house uh, in the wintertime barefooted and, and uh, you know, the weather's cold, uh, you get your feet wet, and you'll get a cold, and then you'll get pneumonia, and then you'll die. And how, how would you like to die because you didn't put your shoes on when you went outside? Or if you go outside with your hair wet in cold weather, or you don't cover the baby's head up with a blanket when you take him outside, you'll get a cold, yada, yada, yada. No, they won't. They will not. Uh, that's not how you get colds. Colds are viruses. You get them from other people. You get them because someone sneezed and wiped his nose, then opened the door. Uh, you get it because someone was drinking water and, uh, you know, uh, 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 you took a drink of it or something like that. You get it because someone sneezed on you or breathed on you. Uh, if you wash your hands in social distance, you won't get colds either. Uh, Avoid touching your nose, eyes, mouth with unwashed hands. If you're sick, stay home. Cover your cough or sneeze. Cover it with a tissue, then throw the tissue away. Then wash your hands, you know. Uh, I live with a nurse, so I wipe off. I, I wash, shoot, I probably wore not, I washed off two or three sets of hands and had them regenerated over the years. Uh, this it's just uh, it's just something that's frequent and automatic, you know. Uh, so you can do that. Uh, wearing a face cover when you're out, social distancing is uh, is is helpful if you keep a distance between you and other people, and you cover your face. Then uh, chances are people uh, won't transmit uh, the illness. If you sit side by side, if you get in a crowd, especially inside, and you're not wearing masks, and you breathe on each other, and you cough on each other, and sneeze on each other, and things like that, uh, that increases the, increases the risk factor. Then uh, uh, also knowing the symptoms of, uh, of COVID-19, or knowing the symptoms of anything, really, uh, you know, if you, ha if you have fever, cough, shortness of breath, 
you probably ought to see a doctor any damn way, whether it's COVID-19 season or flu season or whatever. Uh, if you've been in close contact with someone who's had COVID or uh, uh, been treated for COVID-19 and you have these symptoms, you should especially uh, be wary of that. And again, especially if you're an older person, especially if you're o overweight, especially if you have some of these other complicating uh, uh, disorders that might make matters worse for you. And go to the cdc.gov and look at it, uh, uh, you know, see what they recommend for you to do. Uh, we've had so much confusing information that, and contradictory information come at us since this thing started last February uh, that uh, uh, many of us don't really know what to believe anymore. Uh, you know, should you wear a mask? Should you not wear a mask? Uh, you know, they said, no, you don't need to wear a mask at first. Then they said, yes, you do need to wear a mask. Who in the hell's they? You, you get this information coming at you on TV. You get this information coming at you on the Internet. Uh, and uh, the CDC has been uh, pretty consistent. Uh, and they did say, you did not need to wear a mask if, and then they ticked off all of the things you didn't need to wear a mask for. It was not a, you do not need to wear a mask in general. When asked, is a mask helpful? Absolutely. Does a mask really, uh, uh, reduce risk of, uh, of getting sick? Somewhat. Does it reduce the risk of passing the illness on to other people if you are sick? A lot. Uh, and... This is the thing. It's, it's not uh, about, you know, the Constitution and the amendments and the political party. I don't give a damn if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Communist or a Nazi or, you know, whatever you happen to be. Uh, if there is a likelihood that you can put a cloth cover over your face and help protect other people, then wear the mask. What in the hell's wrong with you? Okay, off my soapbox now. How it spreads. Uh, you know, don't get... Uh, it spreads through exposure. There is no vaccine to prevent cor coronavirus 2019. None. Uh, it doesn't exist. There isn't any. Uh, the... Uh, there's some that are in development. Like I said, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Alonzo, the uh, lady who gave me this PowerPoint to use with you guys, uh, her team, uh, she's working on her team to, you know, to, to develop. They're researching uh, to see if uh, uh, they will, you know, have one ready in, in fairly short time. There's tons of... Uh, uh, of uh, viruses, uh, of, uh, viruses. Yeah, there are tons of those too. There's tons of vaccines out there being tested right now. Uh, and most of them will never see the light of day as far as being mass uh, marketed and mass distributed to people because they're not going to work. Uh, and, uh, you know, they'll, and because they don't work, they won't be sold or anything, but some of them will. There will be some that will, uh, provide, uh, at least some protection. And uh, not all vaccines are, you know, really good long-lasting vaccines. I religiously get a flu shot every year. I got my flu shot last year and still got the flu. That was the bad news. The good news is when I got the flu last year, it wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been if I hadn't had the flu vaccine. Because I've had the flu before, and let me tell you, I have totally lost interest in survival through that process. So uh, the virus spreads from person to person. People are in close contact with one another. It spreads through respiratory droplets that can get in your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, you inhale them, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, COVID-19 can be spread by asymptomatic people who have, who have COVID-19, but they're not showing any symptoms of, uh, of uh, being sick. And that's, uh, and that's bad news. You've heard the story of typhoid Mary, right, in Britain? 
and she was the lady who spread typhus all over London, uh, but she wasn't sick with it. She was just a carrier. Uh, and we do have those kind of people out there. They're not bad people. I'm sure Typhoid Mary was a lot of fun at parties and stuff, but uh, she carried typhus. So to protect yourself, wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Uh, and uh, uh, how long is 20 seconds? I don't want to sit there and look at her watch. If you say, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you, you do that three times, you've got it. Uh, and you don't have to do it out loud, you can do it in your head, because if you're doing it at the sink with other people in the bathroom, they look at you funny. So I hear. If soap and water are not readily available, use a hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Uh, what proof is that, by the way, for those of you that are in my other classes? Absolutely correct. 60% alcohol is 120 proof. So use a 120 proof hand sanitizer. Cover all the surfaces of your hand and rub them together until they feel dry. Avoid touching your nose, eyes, and mouth with unwashed hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick uh, and uh, who are coughing and hacking and things like that. Now, this has always been a hazard for me because every year in the wintertime, you know, I'm up in front of the class spreading truth and beauty and all kinds of stuff like that, and someone will come in and say, <coughs> <laughs> oh, I feel horrible, but I didn't want to miss the test today. And I'm like, by all means, miss the damn test. Don't come to school like that. What's wrong with you? You're making the rest of us sick. Stop it. Uh, if you're sick, stay home. Here's a link to talk about that. These live links are things that you can look at. I'm going to uh, this is a video, and they're not live for you on the video, but I'm going to post the PowerPoint as well, so you can go in a PowerPoint and look around. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, and keep a distance from other people. Something that we learned uh, during, the, uh, during the AIDS epidemic, and uh, we uh, came up with universal precautions. Universal precautions are the things you see now, that uh, when you go to the doctor and they're... Uh, uh, you know, they're going to give you a shot or draw blood or do anything that's invasive or physical contact. They put on a mask. They put on gloves. Sometimes they put on a face shield. Uh, and this was the way you approached uh, treating AIDS patients. And then uh, they decided, uh, they being the physicians uh, and healthcare care uh, providers, that... Uh, you just assume that everybody on planet Earth's got AIDS but you. Uh, and then you uh, uh, will probably do what's necessary to stay safe from, you know, uh, from contact. But then we learn that HIV is also, uh, uh, you know, you, can, you contract it in very specific ways. You're not going to get it from a doorknob. You're not going to get it from people uh, sneezing on you. You're not going to get it. Uh, from not observing uh, six-foot social distancing. Uh, you get it in very specific ways that in, uh, involves a fluid transfer, that you, um, uh, you basically get it through semen and blood. Uh, so if you're sharing needles or having unprotected sex, uh, and even with the unprotected sex, the pitcher is more at risk than the catcher. Uh, so it depends on who's doing what to whom, right? Uh, and there, and because we know that, there are specific things that you can do to avoid uh, getting HIV. But here's another thing. If you are around someone with HIV, wash your hands, put your rubber gloves on, wear your mask and your face shield by all means before interacting with that person. Not because they can make you sick, but because you can have a cold, you can have a sniffle that if you give it to them, it will kill them graveyard dead because they have no immune system left, right? Uh, so again, it's not just about protecting yourself, but it's about protecting uh, other people too. 
Keep your social distance. Wear a face cover. It's Christian, man. Uh, know how to protect yourself. Cover your mouth and nose with a cloth when you're around others. Uh, and it, because it is to protect other people, really. Uh, now, here's the thing down here. Do not use a face mask meant for a healthcare worker. Why do you think they would put something like that in this here particular presentation? Absolutely right. Because when this, uh, when this information was put together, when Joy was putting together this slide, there was a shortage of, uh, of uh, uh, face masks meant for healthcare workers, the PPEs, the personal protective equipment. Uh, and they're talking about the M95s and things like that, the, 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 the mask with the filter in them and those type things. That, uh, uh, and the idea was we shouldn't glom them up because there's a shortage of them for frontline health workers and they were running out. And you probably saw the things on TV where they didn't have gowns and were putting garbage bags on and, you know, taking their uh, face masks home with them and using them for two and three days at a time when they're meant to be disposable. Uh, so uh, I think we've pretty much gotten beyond that. There's, uh, you know, we're beginning to catch up in terms of uh, having the uh, equipment available for frontline workers. So that may not be as big a deal right now. Uh, also, an industry has sprung up around face masks, and you can go find all kinds of cool things on uh, the Internet, uh, fancy face masks that are fashionable and uh, all of that, and fetching. Uh, you know, I've seen the little harem girl face masks that, you know, are pretty cute, <laughs> you know. Uh, the kitty cat face mask, the... Uh, your own face, face mask that's, uh, you know, whatever. The main thing is to have something over your face that uh, uh, protects droplets, keeps droplets from flying out of you onto other people. That's the main thing. It can be as cute as you want them to be. Who should be tested for COVID-19? If you're sick with symptoms of COVID-19, you should be tested. Uh, and uh, you know, if you have uh, if you if you have fever, sore throat, difficulty breathing, particularly if you have diabetes, lung disease, heart disease, pregnancy, uh, you know, whatever, all of these things, uh, you're over the age of sixty, you live in a nursing home, uh, you're part of a uh, an investigation of a cluster or an outbreak, your healthcare workers, first responders. Uh, you should be tested for this stuff. If you don't have symptoms, there's no point in getting tested. I've been tested twice, but uh, I didn't have symptoms. I was uh, 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 one time I just got it because it was free at the college. You could drive through and get tested, and I thought, what the hell? Uh, but if you don't have symptoms, you're li uh, you're likely not to test positive unless you're an asymptomatic spreader. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you get really sick, it doesn't matter if you have a test or not, you should go get medical attention. Uh, if you're, uh, you know, if you have a cold, a flu, something like that, you should stay home. Here's the thing, and uh, I'm going to try to do this in a nice way and not sound like I'm poking fun at President Trump. He announced one day last week that he had tested positive for COVID. And then a couple of days later, he winds up going to Walter Reed Hospital. And he stays there a few days, and then he comes out, and he goes back to the White House and does this big hoop de doo on the balcony, he takes his mask off, does a photo shoot, all that kind of good stuff. And then a few days later, they say he, you know, he's COVID-free or whatever. Uh, and he says, it, you know, it's like a blessing from God, uh, you know. And he said, maybe I'm one of those people that's immune to it. If you have the disease, if you get the disease, uh, if you're diagnosed with the disease, you're not immune to it because you have the disease. You know, immune means you're exposed and you don't get it. But he was exposed and he got it. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, people can say, well, you know, he's old, he's fat. I, I, I'm leveling people. He's overweight. He's 74 years old. He's, uh, you know, he's not in good shape. He eats too many hamburgers and all of that kind of good stuff. Uh, and he came through it like a champ. He came out, you know, he's fine. All, all that's what everyone says. Uh, I can do that too. Maybe you can, you know, if you're tested uh, and then you spend a couple of days uh, under 24-7 care in the White House from the best medical minds on planet Earth, and then they call a marine helicopter, it lands in your front yard and puts you in there, and, you know, a few minutes later you're at Walter Reed Medical Center where you have a six-room suite, and again, 24-7 care from the best, best medical people on planet Earth and access to all of the medications uh, uh, test, you know, approved or tested or whatever, uh, you know, you, you've got a huge medical crew there that's doing nothing but keeping the president alive. You don't. I don't. <laughs> you know, uh, if we get sick, we may be told to stay home and monitor our oxygen levels. We get a little oxygen thing that we put on our finger and it tells us our blood oxygen saturation. If it falls below that, get to the hospital. If we can't breathe, they'll take us in and intubate us. In other words, you gotta be really sick sometimes before they'll take you into the hospital. Rest of the time, stay home. What do you do while you stay at home? You take aspirins. Uh, you drink liquids. Uh, you try to uh, keep your fever down. Uh, you may have to do some kind of breathing treatments. Who knows? But uh, uh, that's the stuff that you do until you get too sick for that to be uh, reasonable anymore, and then you go to the doctor. And then you may make it, and then you may not. We... Uh, Last month, uh, lost uh, a colleague of mine, been a you know coworker for years. Uh, uh, B over in the uh, nursing department who helped register you know the, the nursing students and what, and uh, she died of COVID, you know. Uh, so and she wasn't old, and she wasn't particularly fat, and she wasn't uh, you know any of that stuff, but she got COVID-19 and it killed her. Uh, so it kind of makes things personal. Uh, if you have fever, cough, shortness of breath, you know, you might want to call the doctor. If you're disoriented and can't breathe, call 911, go to the emergency room, do something. Uh, here's where you can get free testing, and here's where you can get pay testing. Uh, this is not comprehensive, by the way. I mean, you know, you can, uh, uh, the drugstore where I have my pharmacy filled, C, uh, prescriptions filled, CVS, you can do drive through testing. You call them up and say, I want to, you know, I want a uh, COVID test. And uh, you drive right through there. They hand you the kit, tell you what to do. You just give it back to them, and boom. Uh, so. Uh, and here's some over in Brazoria and Fort Bend County, too. Additionally, uh, and, and I mean, that's just, that's just for anyone. Uh, populations of people with uh, risk uh, are older people, as I said, who have chronic diseases. Children and teens are at high risk for catching it. I love kids. You know, love them. I've got... Uh, uh, seven grandkids and another one on the way. Um, and, uh, you know, kids are some of my favorite people. Uh, they're little germ boxes. Uh, they do all kinds of stuff. Uh, when this thing first broke out and they were telling everyone to stay home and not visit and stuff like that, well, my nurse, spouse, and I, first thing we had to do was go see our daughter and uh, her, her old man over in uh, Pearland and we went by there. Uh, actually, we were taking her, I forget what we were taking, we were taking something and dropping it off, and we had our bandanas and our rubber gloves and stuff like that. Uh, but when we were going into the neighborhood, we saw her kids over there. 
and in a in a vacant lot playing with a whole bunch of other neighborhood kids, and they were chasing each other and wrestling and you know all of this kind of everything but social distancing going on. Uh, and uh, don't want to make it, uh, you know, guilt trip any young people or anything, but uh, uh, one of the things that I heard, you know, was kind of a warning to kids is you can go to parties and party and do stuff like that and you'll get COVID and you'll be fine, but you're going to take it home and kill your grandparents, uh, which uh, could well be true. Uh, people who uh, are on the front lines uh, who are uh, first responders, who are essential workers, who are healthcare workers, who work in the hospitals and emergency rooms and take care of people with uh, COVID-19 are at risk. People who have mental health conditions are at risk because they have mental health conditions. People in recovery or people suffering from substance use disorder are at risk. Initially, back in March, April, May, on into June and stuff like that, uh, the 12-step programs around here uh, started doing things online. You can, you can go uh, online and go to 12-step uh, meetings and things like that. You can also go online and have your appointment with your doctor, etc., and so forth. But uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, it didn't last long. Uh, and now uh, people are going back to 12-step meetings. Sometimes they're social distancing, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're uh, wearing face covers, sometimes they're not. Uh, people who have mental health conditions and people in recovery or people suffering from substance use disorder are often all the same people. Uh, because it's quite common to find recovering people who have a co-occurring mental or emotional diagnosis as well. It's very common to find that among people who are in recovery, that they have a dual uh, diagnosis. That's not uncommon at all, and we'll talk about that later on uh, in this course. But uh, uh there is an increase in depression. There is an increase in psychotic episodes. There's an increase in suicidality. There's an increase in child abuse. There's an increase in uh, uh, domestic battery. There's an increase in uh, 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 substance use across the board, even for people who are not chemically dependent. Folks who are shot in, they've never had a drug problem in their life are um, uh, drinking to cope, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, so we're seeing increases in risky behavior. There's some uh, mental and behavioral health resources here if you need them, support groups, uh, that sort of thing, uh, and uh, for, um, uh, for yourself or someone you know, I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm not making any assumptions here. I'm just saying here's some, uh, uh, here's some uh, resources if you were to need them. Uh, and there's quite a few of them. I don't see the bridge over troubled waters in there. I don't uh, know why that is, but uh, uh, there are uh, central locations in Pasadena. If you know someone who's got to get out of a domestic violence uh, crisis that needs shelter or something like that. That's a place you can uh, refer. Uh, also, uh, there's been some difficulties with medication access during COVID-19. And this is true with older people too. Uh, generally, the older you get in America, the more likely you are to be on uh, a bunch of medications. Uh, and elderly people sometimes have a great deal of trouble keeping track of their medication, what they're supposed to be taking and when. Uh, they rely on other people to help them uh, with that. Uh, and now they can't get out. <laughs> now people are coming uh, to them. They run out of medication. They forget to fill it. Uh, the doctor, uh, uh, you know, might want you to come in to see him b 
before uh, he writes you another script and people don't have transportation and we can't call cabs and Ubers anymore, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, pharmacies are sometimes very happy to help you out with this. And uh, pharmacies are also quite willing to do three months uh, prescriptions instead of 30-day prescriptions if your doctor's okay with that. So, uh, and they can help uh, negotiate that if you want. So uh, a deal is that you shouldn't do without your medication during COVID-19. You should be taking it right along. As we'll see a little further down the road, people with mental uh, diagnoses, sometimes one of the toughest things in working with them, uh, uh, one of the toughest things to do working with them is to get them to comply with their medicine regimen and take them anyway. Uh, And they uh, uh, may not uh, during this period of time. Uh, Delivery options, cooperative, uh, 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 cooperative, uh, uh, prescription filling uh, can take place where, you know, someone in the neighborhood uh, will go fill prescriptions for everyone or your pharmacy will, uh, you know, deliver them to you. Uh, and uh, if you lose your insurance or run out of insurance, there are programs out there that the pharmacy can help you with uh, to make sure that you don't um, run out of medications uh, during this period of time. For people who have uh, substance use disorders, uh, you're at risk. Uh, You're at greater risk of developing COVID-19 and having complications from it and dying from it if you're a tobacco user, if you're a marijuana user, if you're using methamphetamine, particularly if you're smoking it, uh, and if you're someone who vapes. Now, I know I've probably got a couple of people out there who vape saying, wait a minute, Bushart, I was okay till you got that vape thing. You know, dude, that vape is just water vapor. It doesn't hurt you. Uh, Well, don't want to whiz in your Cheerios or anything, but if you can smell it and you can taste it, it's not just water vapor. There's something else in it, and there's a whole bunch of other things in it, and there's also nicotine in it because vaping is a nicotine delivery system. Uh, and there are other things like diethylene glycol, which is a preservative. It's also antifreeze uh, that a, a little bit's not going to hurt you as a food preservative or what have you. A lot will kill you. Uh, and the FDA's approved it as a food preservative, but nowhere, at no time, no how, no way has the FDA ever approved any of this stuff as free base for you. <laughs> so, Vaping is unhealthy, any way you slice it. Uh, And it does uh, pose potential complications uh, for people who might be exposed to COVID-19. Vaping also leads to substance use disorders. It's diagnosable. People who use opioids at high doses medically or have opioid use disorder uh, have an increased likelihood of respiratory suppression. You don't want respiratory suppression if you have a respiratory virus like COVID-19. You could die. Here's some more uh, resources. SAMHSA, the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health, uh, yada, yada. I can't remember it ever. Uh, But you can, it's a clearinghouse funded by the government that's got uh, all of the um, uh, information that you may need. It's got uh, data that's updated daily. Uh, And so there's plenty of information there around this. Medication Assisted Treatment Anonymous, MARA. This is a new organization. Uh, If you don't know by now, uh, I'll just go ahead and confess. I'm a recovering person. I'm in long-term recovery. I've been clean since uh, April 20th, 19. 82, uh, and uh, except for when I had to have some surgeries and the doctor drugged me up and that was an act of God. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Medicaid, uh, medication-assisted treatment is fairly common today with opioid use disorders, uh, but it wasn't uh, when I came in, and there was a great deal of prejudice 
both in the 12-step programs and in professional counseling towards people who were doing things like uh, uh, participating in uh, opioid replacement therapy, going to methadone clinics and things like that. My experience, and I'm not, uh, I, I, I was never a patient at a methadone clinic, but I know people who were, and I've watched them go through what they go through, including some people I'm uh, pretty close to. Uh, and, it, uh, you know, thank God uh, for medical assisted treatment. Thank God. Uh, because there are a lot of people who wouldn't have ever got anywhere near sobriety without it. And it takes a while. It takes a while. It's not an overnight thing. But it's helped keep people to take the steps that were necessary to get to a point where they could stop using and embrace abstinence altogether. And even for people who don't, even for people who continue on medication-assisted treatment, uh, methadone maintenance for very protracted periods of time, it makes the way they live safer. They don't have to engage in things that could get them hurt, a lifestyle uh, risks are very big in, uh, among people who have substance use disorders, particularly opioid use disorders. So, uh, people who are in medication to treat, uh, assisted treatment can get uh, more at a time. Uh, they may have to, uh, they, they may be more at risk because they're not uh, receiving uh, as much psychosocial supports. They're at risk for overdose, so we need to provide them with uh, naloxone rescue kits. And you can get them all over the place. Bacoda, Texas A&M Opioid Task Force. You can get them from me if I'm in my office, but I'm not. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's better to have one around and not need it than to need it and not have one around. Uh, If uh, you've been in medical assisted treatment for a protracted period of time, you're, uh, and this has something to do with overdose risk too, uh, your tolerance levels drop back off. Uh, and if you haven't been shooting uh, or eating pills for a while, uh, if you uh, worked your way up to a rather heavy tolerance where you were doing a lot and then you twist off for a year or two, and you go back to that last dosage that you were shooting when you stopped, you could very well uh, uh, create an overdose situation for yourself. So you want to be careful about that. Or anyone that you're working with needs to be careful about that. Uh, being alone, nothing to do, can't work, can't get out of the house, can't go out to eat, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, this can put a lot of psychological stress on people. And psychological stress on recovery, recovering people uh, is an overdose factor. It's, a, it's an uh, overdose risk. Uh, it's, uh, I'm saying overdose. Let me rephrase that. It's a relapse factor. Uh, uh, as, as a lot of you know already, that under stress, the first thing an alcoholic wants to do is take a drink. And this, even with people who are in long-term recovery, uh, you know, we're not uh, immune from that either. Uh, so uh, any type of stress that we're put under could, uh, could be a, a relapse factor. The damage that we've done ourselves physically over the years can be a risk in COVID-19 factors. I mean, you know, I don't... I don't smoke cigarettes, and I haven't in a long time, but I mean, I've got some damage from that. Uh, I've, uh, uh, you know, drunk a lot of alcohol on my day. I don't know how much damage I've gotten from that or from the other drugs that I've done. Uh, so, uh, and um, all of that can be a factor if I'm exposed to COVID-19 or to the flu or to... Uh, Zika virus, or you know, that's the word I was looking for a while ago, Zika, uh, or any of that uh, that may uh, uh, come down the road. And you can take it to the bank that when COVID 19 goes away, there will be another virus coming down the road because there always is. 
Uh, and so stay on the, stay out uh, ahead of the curve on that one, right? And this is the end of, uh, uh, of Dr. Alonzo's presentation. And I got real casual while we while y'all were gone. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, was too relaxed, I guess. Anyway, that's uh, basically that. And uh, what I wanted you to do as your assignment, and again, I'll post a link for you. You can you can put it in a file. You can do it on a PowerPoint slide. You can you know write it however you want to do it. Uh, but you can go to any of those sites that I showed you, any of those links, and grab some updated data. Uh, from September, when, uh, and, I, and Dr. Alonzo didn't present any of this in her presentation, but uh, uh, every day, the numbers of people infected with COVID-19 in the United States, and the number of people hospitalized with COVID-19 in the United States, the number of people dying with COVID-19 in the United States, those numbers change every day, every day that, uh, that rolls around. Uh, there is new data and new recommendations coming out uh, from uh, uh, the CDC. There are new, uh, uh, there's new research being done on vaccinations, uh, etc. There's new research, there's new numbers coming out. Harris County does it all the time. They're the health department on uh, opioid use disorders, overdose rates in, in our county, you know, and, and, in the, and in the cities too, it breaks it down. Uh, you can go to region six, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, our area around here with, uh, and uh, uh, Melissa Romaine Harriet, who uh, is with uh, uh, the Houston uh, Center for Recovery, uh, is the main numbers cruncher for that. And she's got lots of data at the Region 6 site. So go to town. Find three areas that uh, 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 among all of that I've talked about today and give me an update. That's all. Uh, and I'll put you a What's changed? What's what? What? It, what does it look like right now? What's it look like today? Why am I making you do that? Well, I got to grade you on something, huh? And also, this is helpful to you, so that when you're sitting around in your office and you're having to come up with a presentation, or you're having to present data to your boss, or you're having to justify something to a uh, uh, to a person who may be willing to give you some grant money if you can answer these questions, you know. If you're doing a prevention uh, uh, program, and this is where it mostly comes in handy if you're working in the prevention field, but, uh, you know, helps you to uh, justify what you're doing and helps you to figure out what target group you want to work with and how you want to work with them and upon which problem you want to uh, work with them because there's a multitude that said, I'm really tired of talking. I love talking to you, but I'm really tired of talking to me and this camera. Uh, so I'm going to stop now and go see what the Astros are doing. Talk to you later. Bye.